So let's start with, um, where were you for the eclipse? Oh my goodness. I feel like a changed <laughs> human do? being after that. Tell. So we are, okay, so just to give you a sense of how big a deal this was, when I was growing up, I was always the kid who got the perfect attendance <laughs> certificates at home, no matter how sick I was. <laughs> I was going to school, that was the mantra, and so to take the kids out of the school is a big deal for, <laughs> for me, but this was, you know, we looked on Reddit, we decided just to, to go for it, it's not going to be here for another 20 years, so we, <laughs> we didn't have anywhere booked or anything like that. Um, I had activities all yesterday anyways, or sorry, the day before, so 5 a.m., we packed the kids into the car great. and drove up to Vermont oh and my God. Oh my God. ended up in a gorgeous state park in Waterbury, Vermont, uh, on top of a hill with all sorts of folks who had set up their chairs and blankets and then even a school group came and, and all of these young people were around. And I'll say, I, I don't, I will remember that forever. Just the experience of it, the, and you knew it was coming too. You know the exact time and the exact seconds that it, the change would happen and yet I don't think I've been that blown away by an experience ever. Just the light disappearing, this, thing appearing in the sky, being surrounded by people who are all either screaming or speechless or every reaction. And it just for a second reminds you of our connection to this wider universe yeah. that we never think of in all of our <coughs> daily lives. And it was beautiful and to be able to be there with the kids and it was worth the hours of traffic coming back afterwards. That was totality <laughs> in where you were in Vermont, yeah, right? Yeah, it was, it was about, I think it was about two and a half minutes. Yeah. Wow, so it, it got very dark. It's just, it's the eeriest feeling too because you kind of know what dusk feels like. You know what it's like when the sun is going down, but to have it happen so fast, but also everywhere at once, just that, it, it just felt like Twilight Zone for a second, and then it clicked, and then this corona appears and you just see this perfect black circle and a little speck of purple on the, on the edge of it. Um, it. It was unbelievable. And it got cold? It got cold. Yeah. It got cold about 20 minutes before and we all bundled up and, and, and then as quickly as it happened, the sun just comes back all of a sudden. You know, we uh, had two producers from uh, the Nova film, The Great American Eclipse, yesterday. One of the many things we learned, you, since you never missed a day of class, but I knew this. Do you know that the surface of the sun is 10,000 degrees? The temperature of the corona is 2 million degrees. Did you, isn't that no. amazing? And by the way, you're every single person with you whom know, we've spoken, we blew including it, Jamie, we our blew lead it. producer, <laughs> didn't I tell you though she's going to be with her kids? Yeah. I did tell you. But everybody who did the totality thing, whether in Vermont, Canada, had the exact same reaction you, you did. This is just unbelievable. Taken out of, I just felt like I was removed from a sense of time, space, place, and, and you get a feeling of what it must have been like over all the different millennia of people witnessing natural phenomenon for the first time. Just that sense of shock of, is, is this real? And, um, and the beauty of it, I, I, I just, how, yeah. How about your kids? What are they, eight and 10 or nine? Or six 11? and nine. Six and nine. Yeah. Did they have that kind of reaction or for them was it Yeah, more one of them was screaming because <laughs> he was so blaze, so excited, so excited. The other one was sitting on, on my lap with me and kind of tucked in and he's, he's much more sort of contemplative and, and seeing what happens. But I, for the two of them to think in the scale of years, they were just like, well, you're going to drive us to the next one in 20 years, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You might be driving slower <laughs> by then. You know, you've now made it totally impossible to talk about your budget, by the way. <laughs> yeah. I mean, how do you do Let's that after? Uh, I'm serious. <laughs> about nickels and dimes. That was really great. Uh, that is really, really great. Yeah. In any case, uh, speaking of your budget and horrible transitions, at least for, for me, <laughs> so my understanding is there's an 8% increase, and this is where I get a little foggy. Please correct me if I'm wrong. At the same time you file this budget, you are asking the legislature to approve a change in uh, commercial tax rates, the goal of which is to raise them on commercial so you spare residential uh, uh, property owners from a dramatic increase in their property taxes. If the legislature is to say no to this, and I read that they said yes to Menino years ago, we don't know what they're gonna do here, it seems to me you only have two choices, and this is where I hope you'll correct me, either 
uh, uh, raise the burden dramatically on residential, on homeowners, on residential property owners, or make dramatic cuts in your budget. Is that a fair summary? It's a little bit. It's a little bit different than that. Um, and first, I will say just in terms of the budget increase, because I know in the context of the state's budget situation and then our um, proactive seeking this legislative tool, it, it feels a little bit jarring to talk about 8% growth. It, it's a bit deceptive. A big chunk of that 8% is actually funding that is being transferred from the what's currently called the BPDA to offset for the new planning department. So it's not new money, but because we created a new city department, and that used to be self-financed by the BPDA on their own books, not accountable to the city. Because we are moving it to the city, we're moving the staff as well as the funding that supports them. So about a quarter of that increase is is just that revenue so neutral 6%, move. Roughly. So 6%, roughly. Which is about, 5 to 6% is about in line with what it's been year over year. Okay, and am I right about the consequences if the legislature fails so to do what you So here's the want? thing about the understanding our tax laws. They are very strict and very prescriptive. Each city has two types of ways they can assess, um, put a rate on how much taxes are paid, either residential or commercial. And you can't distinguish between different types of residential or different types of commercial. It's, there's two buckets. And basically, Prop 2.5 means that cities can uh, take a 2.5 inc percentage increase in their total tax collection every single year to sustain the growth in uh, how quickly health insurance costs goes up for city workers and all of that. So, but how it's applied is however much in taxes you took last year, it increases by 2.5%, and then it automatically gets proportion between residential and commercial. So we actually don't have a choice to say, well, if commercial uh, values are going down and therefore the revenue coming from commercial is going down, we're just going to have a hole in the budget. That's not how the default works. The default is automatically then that it gets proportioned onto residential taxpayers. So if we do nothing and if there is a dramatic decrease in the valuations of commercial properties in the downtown area, then residents will see a significant increase and that is what we are trying to avoid. And just to be clear, uh, the, the framing is, all of this is so complicated, but basically we are in a five-year cycle for property tax revaluations. This is the year that it happens. It's backwards looking, and so we are judging property values based on what happened in the last year, not judging about this economic moment or the year ahead. And if those values end up going down, the, for many of the buildings, the total amount of taxes they are paying are still going down with the reapportionment that we're trying to do legislatively. It just wouldn't go down by as much as it would have so that residential rates don't fill in all of that um, decrease with their own increase. And do you have any indication, I, I mean, unlike when uh, you and we have discussions about needing approval on Beacon Hill uh, uh, in most circumstances, like for example, uh, the issue of rent control, why did you have to go there? There's this constitutional provision that requires if you're doing this tax thing, mm -hmm. you go to them. The only uh, legislator whom I've heard quoted is actually from Boston, Senator Collins, who seemed to be skeptical to say the least. Do you have any indication that they're gonna do what you want them to do? I don't, we've, we've started some early conversations, but here's the tricky part is we don't have the specific numbers to show how much shift would be needed or if it's needed at all. What happened when Mayor Menino went up and did this in 2004 was that they were going through their revaluation cycle as well, which concludes in November, December of a calendar year. Tax bills go out in January. The legislative cycle ends in July. So basically they had waited until the legislature was out of session, they finished their tax property revaluations, realized they had a problem, and then in January, people actually got two bills in the mail because they didn't know if this legislative uh, item would pass or not. They had to wait until January when the legislature was back in session. And that meant that people had two bills, one that said, if it passes, you pay this, if it doesn't pass, you pay that. We don't wanna be in that situation at all. To have the maximum stability and certainty, we need this tool proactively while we're still on this year's legislative cycle versus waiting until it's too late to know um, how, you know, too, too late to tell people exactly what their bills would be in line with the tax cycle. What that means is that we are asking for this tool to be ready just in case. The difference between commercial values two years before and this, this last year was 1%. So it's, we're not anticipating a dramatic catastrophe, but even small shifts can have an impact on the residential side 
because commercial properties end up making up so much of our tax base. So commercial properties paying a little bit less in taxes ends up being a lot more per resident in an increase. And so because the impacts are felt so differently, because we're in the middle of a housing crisis, in order to avoid the default of doing nothing and having residential taxes go up, exacerbating the burden on residents, we are getting this tool to have if we need it. We also have a provision in the legislation that if it's not needed, we wouldn't use it. And we, wouldn't, we would have a three-year window to see if the retroactive yeah. impacts end up pushing us to need it. There is a chance we may not need it at all. One last quick question, though. If, you, if they do say yes, and if you do need it, you're increasing a tax burden on a sector that's having a really difficult time in Boston to begin with, commercial. So aren't you worried that it exacerbates the crisis, that the vacancy crisis, for example, that you're trying to deal with downtown? So I understand the argument that any rate increase is a burden. The total amount of taxes would very likely still go down for these properties. And in the scheme of what we are trying to do in terms of downtown revitalization and, and um, office to residential conversions and um, finding ways to grow our tax base overall, this is, this is a system that we have under, under the tax laws. If you ask me to choose between every single resident and homeowner having to have double digit increases in their taxes or our commercial property owners who definitely are struggling, paying a little bit less of a decrease in taxes, I'm going to choose that every time. And we are trying to seek to support that sector and make sure that from the city side, we're doing everything to avoid longer term impacts so they can recover as well. I forgot to give the number, 877-301-8970. You can either call the mayor or text the mayor at 877-301-8970. You know, one last thing uh, budget-wise, in this same story talking about the proposed budget uh, in the Globe, it also talks about what the school committee has done. They've approved a slight uh, budget. Well, I guess it's not slight, depending on how you call it, 1.45 billion to 1.5 billion for the upcoming school year, but they're also talking about eliminating hundreds of positions. What's What do you see for the schools? Yeah, the school budget has gone up um, in terms of the operating budget and the city's contribution as part of our school funds on top of what the state specifically dedicates for each school district through state funding. Um, Boston has been supplementing more and more of that those state funds because they simply have not been sufficient for the scale of uh, support that we want our students to have and, and that our, our, our school communities deserve. Um, however, the difference here is that the federal, the federal government had given a large pot of money as a one-time pandemic relief right. mechanism. Those dollars were always set to expire around this year and next year. And so the district has been phasing them out over the last several years and working with each school to make tough choices because when you have a, all of a sudden a surplus of funds, they, every dollar was used well and often these were positions that they knew would have to be temporary, but it's still difficult in the moment where it ends up phasing out. We have brought on many, many of those positions onto the regular school and city budget. And so um, Superintendent Skipper has done an incredible job of not just getting results with this funding and seeing the, uh, the progress in the right direction for what we want to see with um, attendance rates and um, retention of our educators and school leaders and partnerships and support and, and all the great things that are happening in our school department. Uh, but we're making a transition as every school district around the country is off of this federal, one-time federal spending. And um, I believe the district's done it in just about as responsible and uh, supportive a way as we could. So I think we have totally destroyed the mood of the eclipse. <laughs> and our number is 877-301-8970. Andrew is at the mic at the Boston Public Library. Hey, Andrew, come on over to the mic. You don't have to say you're Andrew, because we know you are. Uh, welcome <laughs> to the show. Am, you're yes. talking to the mayor. Hi. Hi. Thank you so much, Mayor, for taking Hello. my question. Uh, my name is Andrew, uh, and I'm a journalis journalism and political science student at Northeastern University, uh, and I work for our student-run news broadcast called NUTV, uh, and we cover all the issues that face students in Boston and Massachusetts as a whole. Um, so Boston is a massive hub for higher education. Uh, at the same time, the cost of living here continues to rise. It's currently at 50% higher than the national average. Uh, making it difficult for young individuals to afford to live here. Uh, my question for you is, what is your administration doing to create incentives, and specifically financial incentives, 
for college students to live and work in Boston following graduation. So we're growing the economy here. Andrew, thank you. Before you answer that question, Ben on Twitter, as a variation on Andrew's question, what are your thoughts, Mayor, on the Globe article stating one in four young people are planning to leave Boston in the next five years, the other side of the same coin? Yeah, well, thank you so much for you. your question and for what you do in the school community and in our city. Um, this has always been, in some ways, Boston's secret weapon, but also our um, one of our, our, our challenges as well. More and more, the whole context of cities around the world is that you want to be the place where people want to live. When everyone has options, you can find out about every job opportunity. You can even zoom in to do your work from living in different places much more flexibly than ever before. And so everyone has the choices to go where they can afford to live and where they have fun and have community and want to be. And so we need to make sure that we are fulfilling all of the ways that people make decisions about their lives. First and foremost is housing. How do we continue to grow housing? We're using every possible tool, putting city land into getting developed into hundreds of thousands of units of, of new housing that had been in our portfolio for three decades, working to streamline and uh, improve our processes so that new proposals, especially affordable housing propo proposals, can move through quicker than ever before. And also um, trying to find ways where we're actually leaning in and leading on, on concepts like social housing, where um, publicly subsidized housing allows for a whole range of income levels of people to stay and thrive in a community. When it comes particularly to college students deciding, and I'm, I count myself as one who wasn't expecting to live in this area when I came out here for college and fell in love with the community, got a job here afterwards, and also got to know the community throughout my, my years here. All of those pieces are important. Having the um, job opportunities, check in terms of there's a lot going on here, a lot of the growth industries for the next generation are right here. Um, but being able to then get to know the community throughout the summer so that we're not, we don't just have our universities as little bubbles that don't interact with the rest of the city, that's where events like Open Streets, where we shut down an entire street in a major, uh, a major street in a neighborhood and have public events or have other fest festivals or really intensive internship programs and fellowships. So there's an engagement throughout your time on campus so you feel this is your community. Uh, a lot of the sports, arts, cultural, um, public events are tend to be the drivers in, in kind of attracting and, and having people get to know and feel like they connect with this area, and then having the infrastructure afterwards. Uh, particularly this generation, smarter than any other before of understanding, I'm choosing a place not just for fun right in this moment, we need to have more welcoming and inclusive nightlife economy um, and other uh, opportunities, but is this a place where I could eventually raise a family if I want? Our childcare costs appropriate, our housing costs affor affordable, not just to rent, but to buy a home. We have programs going on all those fronts. I would say the biggest factor I always say for whether people will want to be in our city and can uh, come to the places they want to get to is public transportation. That is often the first impression that our college students have of the city and how well we're running, even though, even though it is a state entity and um, even though there are different things happening in different pockets. So the more that we can work together to ensure that there's priority on fixing and improving public transit as well, I think the smoother experience for everyone. And um, I've been pushing for more affordability throughout all ways of accessing public transit. The system should be free at some point in the future. We should start with buses right now and we're moving forward on a discounted fare for residents who um, uh, economically qualify for it. And so there will be all these ways in which the experience, the support, the financial barriers will keep coming down. Uh, Andrew, thank you thank so you. much uh, for your question. Our number is 877-301-8970. Before we go to the phones, Mayor, you mentioned you found a job here. One of the people for whom you worked is Senator Warren. I assume you read the story that uh, she ventured her legal opinion about what Israel is doing in Gaza yesterday and said she thought it was, uh, that legally it was genocide. She wouldn't say what her own position was on that issue. She did say she opposed more weaponry. Wh what did you think about what uh, Senator Warren had to say about uh, Israel's uh, behavior in uh, Gaza? I, I have said from the beginning, I have full faith in our federal delegation, our Congresswoman and our senators and, and those in Massachusetts to know the issue well to study all the, the relevant factors and to advocate for the values and the interests of community members here. And so um, 
I think just as a, a person who is watching all of this unfold, just like so many others, and someone who has a bit of a role in making sure that our communities on the ground feel safe here and understanding mm -hmm. the connections that Bostonians have to um, all, all the conflicts, you know, in every part of the world, but especially here, it day by day, seeing the, s the scale of devastation, seeing the number of children and civilians who are being impacted, um, it, it, it's horrific. Um, and so I think from the beginning, the Boston area has been one that has called for peace, of a return f of all the hostages, of uh, a ceasefire, of aid to, um, to the residents on the ground who are, are suffering in this situation. Um, and I, I trust our federal delegation to continue advocating and working with this administration and using the levers that they have. Our number is 877-301-8970. Amina, in Cambridge, you are on with the mayor of Boston, Michelle Wu. Thanks for calling. Welcome. Hi. Hi, Jim and Margie. Thank you so much. Sure. I love your show, by the way. Thanks. Oh, thank um, you. So thank you for, for everything that you bring and giving actual enough time, <laughs> I feel yes. like, than a lot of other shows. Thanks. And what I wanted to ask, uh, Mayor Wu, I wanted to ask uh, a question about your schedule. So I am a single parent living in Cambridge. I only have one kid, and I'm barely able to be in all the places <laughs> I am. Not and laughing I, at I you, really Amina. Am. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm in awe, and I'm also just, I, I want to hear from you, if you don't mind sharing. Like, how do you manage that? Because I've been at, at events and conventions, and I see you show up, give an incredible speech, talk to people, meet people, and then I'll see you again later, and then it's like, I'll see you in the press conference, and then somehow you seem to be everywhere, but at the same time, you earlier talked about having a young family, six and nine, and I'm like, as a human being, with a family, with, you know, a life, how do you manage your responsibilities and in your capacity as mayor to really be in so many places? Best yeah. question of the day, yeah. Amina, without all, a doubt. We all wonder that, even those of us whose kids are grown and gone. Okay, how Thank do you, you do it, Mayor and, Wu? And probably the one for which I have the worst <laughs> answer, which is just, I've, every day sometimes it feels like I'm just trying to keep up. You know, it's, there are so, especially as a working mom, there are so many things on the list that end up just feeling like you have to either put it aside. Or it's just impossible to do everything that you want to do. And so there's this constant game. Sometimes it feels like the like spinning plates up on the, <laughs> <laughs> in like a ma magic act or something of, do I really need to do laundry today? Like, can it, is there something I can shake out of the pile <laughs> that, that is clean and, and just get one more day and then I can have a day here? Okay, I'm gonna open my phone and show you, um, let me just count how many different colors there are in my calendar. One, two, three, four, five. So, oh, six. Okay, so there's six different colors of types of so events are. that are wow. the kinds of things that I have to keep track, which is what I'm doing every day, what the family's and the kids' <laughs> schedule is, things that I can't go to, but if something got canceled, I could go to on the work <laughs> side, things that are personal, just like, you know, in the doctor's <laughs> appointment or remember to do this or that, that doesn't fall in any other category, things that I should know about. Um, <laughs> and it, it's just, it's <laughs> madness in terms of the, the, the schedule really determines everything. And I will be in a meeting in one place, and sometimes I can't remember if I had breakfast that day, <laughs> where I was three <laughs> meetings ago, because I just open my calendar and go to the next thing. And I, I have full control with my team of what we put on that calendar, you know, anywhere from two to two weeks to two months in advance. But once the day arrives, in some ways, it's just kind of everything is set, and there's it feels like there's very little flexibility. And that's when being a mom and the, like, you have to come you know, so and so, one of the kids threw up at school, or that like it, it's just the most humbling of balance because you remember that no nothing is can ever be 100% within your control. You do your best, you try your best. Um, one thing that we've started recently with the family, especially as the kids are a little bit older and have all their own activities now, instead of just coming with me to events, uh, we have this weekly <laughs> worksheet that my husband and I go through where each day has a column. And then the row, there's little boxes that are what time I'm getting home, what time the kids get home, therefore what the dinner plan is of am I going to pick something up on the way back from my last event? Uh, do we pre 
do the uh, like ingredients on Sunday night and then throw it together, or do we kind of really have time to cook or, or do something else? What is it that we are going to eat that day, ideally planned out on the Sundays, and then what is the goal for that day? And that can be do the laundry. I try to keep it very low key or, you know, pull out all the tax documents so that they're in one place so that the goal three days later is actually finish the taxes, right? Um, and having that, I found that at least you don't always, it doesn't always go according to that, but it just limits the amount of decisions on the fly that you have to make of, okay, now, oh no, it's dinner time. What do I, should I go out and get something? At least you have thought about it before and then it just makes it easier to just kind of do it. Amina, you feel better? <laughs> Did mention sleep. <laughs> yeah. That's a yeah. different color <laughs> on the coating, by the way. Amina, that was an excellent well, question. I'm really I glad you Amina, asked. I mean, it said you're a single mom, right, Amina? Yeah, single mom, one you, kid. You, you have got Mr. M my husband first man. is amazing. And I think that you cannot. My sisters are in yeah. the area. I, I my, uh, we live in a two-family home with my mom, and so there's all sorts of. I'm so blessed to have lots and lots of um, helping hands and, and still me, lots of plates, but multiple people tell you, I, I'm totally exhausted listening to that schedule. I must admit, totally exhausted, but totally impressed. You have to be very organized. I think that's Just like you were when you were a mother of young children, Marjorie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mayor, well, we got to take a break. Before we do, can we discuss something else that you mentioned the word community a couple times to answer your first question? We see the marathon infrastructure going up. One Boston day is around yeah. the corner. Could you fill us in on what's, what's happening this year? Yeah, um, the Boston Marathon is our biggest event of the year. We welcome visitors from all around the world to celebrate this human spirit and resilience and everything that, that uh, this incredible sport represents. We also celebrate the fastest Bostonians. Uh, so that was a new award that right. will continue this year. But as many folks in, in our community um, know and always will remember, in 2013, um, an act of terrorism took several lives and left scars on so many others. And so One Boston Day is always on April 15th, uh, remembering the uh, lives that were lost, the loved ones, the survivors, the community that came together around that, the first responders and healthcare workers. And so um, there are various events, formal events, such as quietly laying a wreath with um, the specific community and, and those impacted by the lives who were lost and, and all those who were impacted. Um, and then in terms of the entire community, we encourage everyone to do acts of kindness or service. Uh, there are some public events you can get involved in, cleanups in parks or um, volunteering in different locations, or just take a moment to smile, have a conversation with someone on the tee with you that day, um, buy a cup of coffee for someone who's standing in line next to you. It's a reminder of how Boston came together and that is ultimately who we are. Are you still doing the tea thing with uh, yes. Kinsett you are? How's that going? <laughs> it's great. Just explain, I didn't explain. You ride oh, yes. the tea, go ahead, I'm sorry, and then we'll take um, a break. I have, uh, there's a series called Commute With Me where different residents can invite me to commute with them and so I will document, I just kind of bring my phone and video different clips of our journey. Um, I've been on just about every line now, a lot of different bus lines, and it's a chance to talk about what they do, who they are in the city, as well as how much public transportation can be a stressor or a, a vehicle to be able to uh, put together all the pieces of what you love in your life. Where do we find those if people want to see Those are on our social media, so are. you can find it on TikTok or on Instagram. And by the way, home. speaking of the tea, I should have mentioned Phil Lang, the general manager of the tea, is with us for an hour <coughs> on Friday to take your questions and ours, 11 to 12. Phil Lang will join us at the library. Okay, the mayor of the city of Boston, Michelle Wu, is going to be with us till the top of the hour. You're listening to Boston Public Radio, 89.7 GBH. If you want to call or text, the number is 877-301-8970, or you can come down here to the Boston Public Library, where we are broadcasting live. We're also streaming at youtube.com slash GBH News. We'll be right back. Be running with them, be running with my people. Running for sport is not really a thing in Haitian culture. If you're running, logic says there must be a reason. For elite Haitian runners participating in this year's Boston Marathon, the dream is to one day need no reason. That I'm always kind of at the back of my mind, hoping that the day will come that I don't have to run to raise funds or awareness about grave situations in Haiti. I'm Esteban Bostillos. This story tomorrow on GBH's Morning Edition.
Our programs are made possible thanks to you and Johnson & Wales University. From faculty mentors to research and internships, JWU helps students explore their passions through an immersive approach to education. You can discover more at jwu.edu. And Upstart Logic, founded in Silicon Valley in 1998, committed to helping CEOs and their teams diagnose and solve intricate problems, cultivate leadership, and develop company culture. Learn more at upstartlogic.com. And Q Legal, providing legal marketing solutions for law firms in Boston and beyond. Marketing strategies include websites, social media, video, and search. You can learn more about their services at qlegal.com. And Babson College. Students can gain the know-how to become a successful leader at the number one graduate school in entrepreneurship, ranked by U.S. News and World Report. Virtual Open House, April 17th. Babson.edu slash grad open house. I'm Marco Werman reporting from Israel's northern border with Lebanon, where a simmering war with Hezbollah has caused thousands of people to evacuate with mixed emotions and no idea when they can go home. I'm not feeling angry. I'm feeling concerned about the future of my kids. In limbo on the Israeli-Lebanese border, it's on the world. This afternoon at 3, here on GBH News 89.7. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. Jim Browdy and Marjorie Egan. Mayor Wu is with us for the remainder of the hour. You can speak with her or text her at 877-301-8970. And Ethan, our colleague, is over there if you would like to uh, have him considering putting your question in queue for the mayor directly. Before we continue, you brought something marathon related yes, for us? Yes, this is for you from the Boston Athletic Association. Oh. Just a little... 2024 marathon hat. Uh, Bank that. of America is the is the sponsor for the first time this year. So, all new um, <laughs> logos and things. <laughs> Thank for you. Lovely, well. lovely. That's a great hat. Thank you very much, uh, um, Madam Mayor. So we've asked you about this before, but it seems to be continuing as a, a source of uh, debate around the city is White Stadium. That's the uh, stadium out in Franklin Park that uh, is proposed to have this. You know, soccer team there, but they're still upset about what's going to happen to Boston Public Schools and their football season uh, teams. There was a whole new piece written by two gentlemen who I guess played football back in Boston. Where do they say? In the 60s. Michael Thomas and uh, Daniel um, Aramian. Aramian, Aramian, who graduated from English High School in 66. That's Aramian. And, uh, and they're from the English High School Association. Anyway, they're complaining about the loss of the stadium for the high school. So where are we now? Can I read their question, which I think summarizes the whole thing? Sure. They say near the end, couldn't some accommodation be reached with a women's professional soccer team to allow the football teams, I mean the high school t uh, teams, to use the stadium for the rest of the regular season rather than just post-November or whatever? So I think it's it's really important to um, make sure we're clear about what the situation is with football and with other sports in terms of the scheduling right now, because there, there are some misconceptions. And I, frankly, I do think as a whole, we are, um, for, for one reason or another, because of the decline in the stadium and, the, and lack of investment and uh, the sort of shape of the youth sports program overall, we are in a different place where the demand for the stadium right now is very different from than it might have been several decades ago. Um, we have seven uh, varsity football teams across the entire school district. Two of them use White Stadium in some way. The others don't at all. Um, the two that use it, Boston Latin School and um, Boston Latin Academy, uh, they have their practices elsewhere. So ni neither of the teams use it for their day-to-day -day, uh, drills or, or practices or anything like that. They One of the teams, I think BLA, uses the Playstead, which would still be available. Uh, that's the park area outside the stadium, but immediately adjacent. And so they change in the uh, stadium using the locker rooms, and then they go out and practice. And that would that could still continue, that, that arrangement. These two teams use the stadium as their home home field, which means they each play five games there. And that's the extent of football that happens in the stadium right now. We are um, helping one of the teams renovate their current practice field to, with a scoreboard and with everything so that they will be set up actually closer to where the school is and with the facilities that they have to be able to play their games there as well. And then um, the other team, we're actually renovating an entirely different field and, and creating a whole new 
uh, space for football with with all of the scoreboard and and equipment and and all of that. So there will be new and additional football facilities. Um, there's a limit because we're keeping it as grass instead of artificial turf. There's some limitation on how much uh, wear and tear that the field can take from different types of sports during, you know, in one season. There's also you know, concerns about the lines and, and this and that. So the number of hours that Boston Public School students will be able to use White Stadium is just going to be exponentially more. It will more than triple. Uh, the number of hours that football will use the stadium may actually end up being the same uh, or even more than it is right now because we will have the capacity to host home uh, end of season games for all of the teams in the district, not just for the home games for the two of them here. They will have places where they get to play during the season just as their other teams play um, in other fields during the season. And then White Stadium really will be everyone's kind of marquee uh, championship showcase stadium for, for those games. And the, um, we believe there will the, the impact of, of having a stadium with functional plumbing and locker rooms and uh, the seating that can, can create an experience that that, that, will be, um, that will be worth more than trying to just tie together some of the loose threads. And for, for brief, are you meeting with the litigants? Forget the football thing for a second. Are you meeting with the litigants? I know they got an injunction was denied. Their injunction request was denied. Are you, is the city meeting with them to try to resolve the differences over parking and other issues they have, or is that? Um, so the litigants have not expressed a specific concern about um, the types of issues that are related to the design or parking transportation. They, they are just, the lawsuit was about whether the city has the legal authority to even consider a project a like private, this because with a they're lease. private, yeah. Yep. Um, that, the court decision was very clear that not only was the judge not giving them the immediate emergency uh, injunction or stop to uh -huh. the proposal right now, but they even went ver pretty far in taking every one of their claims within the decision and saying, this will not have a likelihood of success in the larger case. So I'm, the legal teams are, are, I leave it to them to figure okay. out if and when they're going to drop their, their lawsuit and all of that. But we are proceeding with traffic, parking, design okay. with community members and with the Franklin Park Can we Coalition. stay on high school for one a second? The a good news and a bad yeah. news story. The good news story, I think it's wonderful. I didn't know about it until yesterday. State champions. This parade for state yeah. champions. From the, you can tell us about that. But at the same time, please also address this, this painful study, and I'm sure it's painful for you too, about how many high schoolers feel sad, feel hopeless, and what the city is trying to do to address those kinds of things. Yeah, it, it, it really is uh, one in the same conversation of, especially over the last few years and the pandemic, the sense of isolation, but you know, I would argue that even pre-pandemic, yeah. as social media has become more and more of the, the adolescent experience, um, that, that leaves some, uh, there's less and less in-person interaction and larger community building, and that has real impacts on mental health and well-being, particularly for young people and their families. And so um, we continue to see that we need ways for young people to not just come to school ready to learn, but to feel excited to be at school because they it is their community, it is their home, it is with loved ones among their classmates and mentors and um, other educators and adult figures at school. And it, that can't just be about academics. Certainly we want every single track, career track to be available. We're putting early college and vocational education in. We are creating direct pipelines into jobs uh, like with the, with the EMK Health Careers Institute, uh, Health Careers High School and um, Mass General Brigham and partnerships on climate tech and all in many, many areas. But sports, arts, fun, and a sense of belonging goes a long, long way. And that's why youth sports is so important. That's why having performance and public art and opportunities for our young people to be creatively engaged is so important. And so we have a policy in our administration. You bring home a championship, you get a parade. Uh, <laughs> and so that meant that last year at the end of the year, we celebrated the city's first ever Pop Warner National Championship with uh, our very young uh, people, a, a boys team and a cheer squad, a, a girls cheer squad that had brought home the national championship from Florida. And then in this winter season, five Boston schools won state championships. And so it was, okay, let me see if I could get all of them. The um, Cathedral Panthers, the girls basketball team, uh, New Mission Titans, boys basketball team, Charlestown Townies, boys basketball team, 
uh, Boston Latin School Wolfpack boys hockey team. Very good. And then two individual wrestlers from wow. the Josiah Quincy School, um, women's wrestling. Um, they all won state championships, and so we had a, a joint parade. They all got to know each other. We had a big press scrum and pizza party in City Hall and, and uh, really showed off their talent, their determination, and also the larger community's love for our young people and seeing the potential that they represent. It's great. Julie in the car, you're on with the mayor of the city of Boston, Michelle Wu. Welcome, Julie. Hi. Yeah, I live in uh, Navy Yard, and I just moved out of a um, big district there called uh, Harbor. At the hey, Julie, Ooh, we're going to put you on hold. I hate to do this to you. It's a horrible connection. Yeah. We'll try to get back to you in a second if you're in a different location. Yeah, he's at Charlestown Navy Yard. I oh, I know, <laughs> that's a, we'll, we'll try her again in a second. Kate in Georgetown, you're on with the mayor. Um, hi, Mayor Wu. Um, I am from normally from California, and um, with the earthquake and with um, all these things coming up, I'm wondering what you're doing to work across New England states with fire. Um, California um, coordinates with the whole state and, um, and police and also schools. It seems like there's more collective and less individual, um, which is more costly. So I'm wondering what you're going, what you're doing as far as fire and all of those kind of things. Thank you, Kate. Coordinating. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, our Office of Emergency Management in Boston serves as the hub of a regional system where all of the law enforcement agencies and public safety first responders are plugged into um, a, the one source of information and coordination. Um, there was a little bit, it, it was in the news earlier in the calendar year around a regional grant that comes from the state and um, that the city council did ultimately advance in order to make sure that we have the resources to fund that. Um, the, the Boston Marathon is actually a good example of how that works in the day to day. This is one of the, there's a, a classification system for different types of public events in, in the country and their, uh, what is the assessed risk level or threat level and big events like the Super Bowl, Super Bowl, because there are so many people coming in from all over, it's high profile, there's a lot of attention on it, that is in the highest category. The Boston Marathon is also in that category in terms of um, our local event that qualifies. And so that means we have federal f um, public safety and first responder agencies that come in and coordinate statewide, regional, and every, every community along the marathon route as well. There's a series of briefings that set up a structure. Um, we will have some even later in this week and uh, in the coming days to make sure that everyone is on the same page. And then there's oftentimes a um, regional command center that is set up as well just to monitor everything in real time and ensure that each agency has a representative there all in one place and all together. That's, those are the, the kind of one-off events that we know are happening that we want to be prepared for in terms of preparing for the unexpected or the unscheduled uh, events that knock on wood um, hopefully will not happen, but that we also need to be prepared for. The Office of Emergency Management is also coordinating. Uh, we have put forward some uh, proposals to the federal government around resilience and um, preparing for flooding across the region. And there are other areas where we've identified uh, the need for Boston to really step up and coordinate with our, our surrounding municipalities. Thank you much for the question. Julie's going to give it another shot. Okay, Julie's great. Julie's in the car. Thank you for, for being patient, Julie. Try, try again. again. Hi, yeah, sorry about that. Uh, okay. Yeah, I just moved out of an apartment building called Harvey at the Navy Yard in, um, in town because of a huge um, rent increase. And I've, I was trying to find out if there is any kind of a law that you requires the landlord to give the tenant ample time to decide whether or not they want to take a big increase or find a new place to live because we were required uh we're paying four thousand dollars a month for a tiny one bedroom oh. in that building and oh. we were required uh, to to give them 60 days notice to move out they gave us seven days to, when they told us about a 10% rate increase, so $4,400 a month they now want, um, and, you know, to decide if we wanted to accept that or give our notice, which just seems patently unfair. I just cannot believe there's not a law that protects tenants from this. 
And I went to Mass.gov. I, I contacted um, the Housing Authority. I went uh, to the tool on the Mass.gov website, which is great, called Ask the Legal Librarian, to find out if Massachusetts has a law to, to uh, require tenants to be given ample notice about these big rate increases we on got, their rent. Yeah, Julie, yeah. We are, let's, hear, let's hear what the mayor has to yeah. say. I think she understands the issue. Thank wow. you. Wow. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm sorry and hope that you are still in Boston somewhere. Uh, we know that our housing crisis is affecting every neighborhood and everyone along all parts of the income spectrum and, and all professions and industries. Um, in this case, it, it sounds like it's very much determined by the lease and the terms that were originally signed there, but we have put up a home rule petition the idea of stabilizing rents is to give people the time is to manage their lives. It's not to say we're going to change market conditions and um, take away the ability for an industry, in this case, um, property landlords uh, to function, but spacing it out a little bit is make or break for families and for residents to be able to handle all the other things that have to go into their lives. And so this actually would uh, be covered by uh, our, our provision, it sounds like, where we would have a cap on the rate of increase uh, just to give that sense of predictability. Uh, one other, one provision that is related but doesn't apply here, we have a condo conversion law in Boston where if a landlord is, or a property owner is purchasing a building to basically remove all the tenants and convert it into condo ownership, because this was a trend that the city was experiencing um, starting from a couple, uh, from a little over a decade ago, there are provisions there for how much time each tenant has to have, and in some cases even compensation for them to uh, address their needs, particularly if they're if it is a, a household with a tenant with a disability or seniors. Uh, but that applies in the relatively narrow space of condo conversions, and we've been asking for the rent stabilization law to be considered in the same vein. There's already a template that exists that helps people ease the sudden shock of a, a dramatic um, increase in their costs. In some ways, the tax shift classification proposal is the same idea as well. We are not asking to take away anyone's ability to um, function in an industry, but just to ease a tran transition and cushion a shock so that it doesn't end up uprooting people from their daily lives and our kids from our schools and, and everything else that is really important to the stability of our community. We wish you a lot of luck, Julie. A couple of quick things, we're running out of time. It, correct me if I'm wrong, our American Rescue Plan money, federal money, I think is used for one of the things we just talked about, this mental health yes, yes, thing. Yes, yes, absolutely. I think it's also used, I think, for your, I think it's called space program, mm -hmm. the effort to get the storefronts that have been abandoned and you're nodding in agreement. What, that money's all disappearing. I mean, so what does a mayor do when so many, uh, I assume people would agree, important projects are funded by federal funds that are not to reappear? So um, we tried to use our ARPA dollar to have lasting impact, knowing that they would be one-time funds. So in some cases, it's helped us build infrastructure with the space grants, for example. There's now a whole process and mechanism where the city has the expertise in-house to be able to know how best to support businesses and what they've needed, mm -hmm. and we can, with the funding that we can find, continue on in some of those pathways. There's also been a proof of concept where now we have been and will continue to partner with philanthropy or other sources of funding, wh whether it's state or federal funding or just uh, generosity within Boston or companies that want to get involved with the partnership. This is a proven program now that works, and we have that in multiple of our key areas, whether it is mental health mm -hmm. and behavioral health, small business creation, um, housing creation, climate. There are ready-made programs that we could turn back on in a second uh, with the right partnerships. Yeah, speaking of federal, though, the last thing for me is, uh, I assume you saw the Wall Street Journal polls that showed uh, Joe Biden, you were campaigning for him in New Hampshire. We know you're a big supporter. Joe Biden trailing in six of the key swing states. I think the only one where he's not trailing Donald Trump is in uh, Wisconsin. How, how concerned are you about what happens in November? I'm very concerned. Um, we, I mean, we've been down this pathway before. We have been through this exact matchup before, and so we know how ugly it will get. We've also been down a path where uh, this particular candidate shows what 
they're capable of. And I think they're being very clear, uh, tapping into an anger that, that people feel at a lot of stressors in their lives not being addressed by government effectively or, or um, you know, trying to fix challenges that have actually been the result of decades of uh, lack of funding or engagement. And we, I, I, I will say, in any space, it has, it has been completely um, transformative to have the partnership from the Biden administration, not only with how they handled working with, the, uh, with Congress and with our delegation, for example, on finding funding that is now there for new infrastructure, for climate resiliency, for job creation and housing creation, but it's a team approach where we talk to someone from the White House every, every single week on some program that we are launching or working on, and when you have a team there that is aligned with trying to support cities and solving brute problems listening to the people who know best in our communities, it's night and day from having to arm up again and get ready to fight your own federal government in order to protect your residents. Mayor Wu, good thank to you. see you. Thank you very, very much for coming nice in, to Mayor see you as Wu. Always. Thank you for that wonderful explanation of handling the family. I love that.